Okay, I think it's time. So this is our agenda for tonight. I've got to turn the other way now. It's going to throw me right off. Uh, we're not going to, well, we are going to spend some time on the bring and brag. And uh, a lot more time on the uh, yum yum let's eat. So, uh, it's a bit of a reduced agenda today, but that's okay. First of all, I'd like to ask if there's any first-time attendees. And if, if there are, if you could stick your hand up, then I can k skip this slide. Okay. Uh, just a reminder, you've got till uh, the end of December to renew your membership because there is no January grace period. After December 31st, if you haven't renewed, you will have no access to members only. Okay, you won't get any journals, you won't get any newsletters, nothing. Okay, um, if you have a family membership, it's particularly important you get a hold of the office before December 31st because, in fact, I think they're closed like the 22nd or the 21st. Uh, because if you renew it, you can keep it. But if you let it drop, you aren't going to be able to get a family membership back. They've gotten rid of that category. Uh, we still have the Grow Your Family until December 15th, so if there's anybody here who isn't a member and would like to be one at 50% off, and if we have members here who would like to save 50% on their regular membership, we'll put the two of you together. Okay? Just catch us at the uh, social. Now, I'm going to keep, you're going to get this slide until I get somebody. <laughs> okay? I need a note taker for our council meeting. It's only nine meetings a year. You start at the end of January, you skip the summer, and you skip December. That's all I need you to do is to take notes. So, if anybody feels up to that, I will embrace you, give you a kiss and say thank you very profoundly from the bottom of my heart. And two extra cookies tonight. Oh, they can have the whole table. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the other thing we'd like to, like to have is some members at large. You wouldn't have any specific duties, but you'd come out and join the council once a month, nine months of the year, and um, it's for fresh ideas and new perspectives. So, the council has been together quite a while and they're a great bunch to work with, but it doesn't hurt every so often to get someone in with new ideas and a new perspective. So if you feel you're that person, we'll take you, okay? Uh, B, no correspondence, okay. I have some dates for you to remember. So we are going to have our day of learning again. It's going to be May 11th at Faith United Church. We're still working on the theme, and we're going to have a call for speakers probably in January in the e-weekly, and at our January-February meeting too. Uh, we'll be looking for speakers. I um, can't remember the topics exactly. There was a, a more... Uh, DNA Next Steps and um, Irish, Advanced Irish, we need that. Planning, planning a trip. trip. Planning a, a research trip. Yeah. Okay, that was one. And I forget what else. We had at least one more. We did a lot of brainstorming last week. The OGS has got a, their annual conference our annual conference, because it's ours too. It's at the London Convention Center, June 21 to 23. We got some postcards at the back. 
if you want to grab one, that'll be a reminder for you. The call for speakers has definitely gone out. I know they've chosen the speakers they want, but there's still a few um, of the uh, contracts to be signed. So I'm sure in the new year, as soon as eWeekly gets our hands on the list, it'll be sent out to us. I told you this was an abbreviated <laughs> agenda. So at this point, Nancy? Yes. You want to do your bit? Yes. Okay, come on up. <coughs> I just wanted to remind people that we're always looking for um, articles for our newsletter. It's a good way, if you are doing genealogy and you would like to um, get your research problems and things in front of a group of genealogists that belong to our branch, um, you could write up a half a page or one page or however much you want, well, not a book, <laughs> um, um, about, uh, about things you've discovered uh, about your family. If, if you can um, make it so that it's um, relevant to many people, then it's, more people will read it. Um, so, for instance, if you tell how you found things, or where you found things, and stuff like that, or what you're looking for. So, um, a, 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 a lady sent me last time an article about a tombstone that she took a picture of, and then when she went back, it wasn't there anymore. She thought someone might like to know what it was on it. <laughs> so, 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 it could be anything, really. But, uh, so, uh, send them to the branch email address that's on the website. if you. Uh, just want to write something up, and you'll see yourself in print. Yeah. I did. <laughs> okay. The one that we just. It should be. Uh, it should be going out. Sure. Yes. It's on, It's printed. So. Yes, we. Yeah. Have. The newsletter, the summer issue. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we 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 currently have just finished putting together the summer issue. You know, it's still balmy outside, isn't it? <laughs> we wish. Um, and the the fall issue will be coming as quickly as we can. So if you could get a little article or um, a little something in, we'd really appreciate it. So Anne, I noticed you're number four on the list. <laughs> But there's nothing for one, two, and three. That's Steve's fault. He put himself number five. I see that. Do you want me to just shake this up and just, just kind of point? Oh, You'll come? Okay. knows what this is. <laughs> no? Okay, so this is a type tray and it's part of my heritage because my father ran a printing business from our house uh, all the time I was growing up and I, I uh, uh, made my pocket money by putting all the little lead letters back into the tray after, you know, that was, my parents would um, create things with their with the letters and run them off on the press and then uh, wipe off the ink and so nobody told me that maybe I should like wash my hands afterwards after handling all that lead you know <laughs> nobody mentioned that you know you're sitting there eating an apple you know put them anyway so so I'm totally stunted right but anyway um, I had to memorize where all the uh, letters went because they're not in alphabetical order. You can see that various uh, uh, little cubby holes are different sizes mm -hmm. and can you guess, and I will hold it, I'm holding it upside down so that's no good, uh, can you guess which one was for the letter E? A big one, yeah, that's right, here. <laughs> um, what about capital? Capitals were over here, oh. and they're in alphabetical order. You don't use them as often. 
um, <coughs> unless you're making lists of names. So my, my parents, um, they had two kinds of printing uh, equipment, the letterpress, and you've probably seen these in the museums. We had one just like the one in, in, in the Scuba Museum <laughs> with the big platen and uh, a big flywheel on the side. And, and then they also had a more modern one with a photographic process. So we had a giant camera in our basement as well. And, uh, but my, my parents uh, didn't do book binding because their, their press was not big enough, wasn't big enough to do the kind of uh, proper books where the paper is this big and then it gets all folded up and stitched. So they did um, ones with smaller pages. One of the things they did a lot of was cookbooks. So here's some cookbooks always have poo all over them, but <laughs> these are cookbooks that, that, that came from my uh, parents' printing. And, and they also did things like fair brochures and um, church bulletins and all kinds of things like that because there were no photocopiers in those days. So all kinds of Talk things. about your mom's cookbook. What was missing from it? Oh, <laughs> yes. Okay, so um, uh, sometimes what, once my parents started to do the photographic process, um, sometimes they didn't <coughs> have the font they needed. Um, and so they would cut the words they wanted out of a book. So my mother's cookbooks um, often had pieces missing out of the pages because my dad needed the word, you know, cookie or something, to go along and cut it out of the book and paste it <laughs> on his original. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, anyway, that that's what I what I brought uh, for me. But I brought something for Dan's family too, because he was busy getting this stuff ready. Um, you probably know what this is. It's a very old quilt top that was never made into a quilt. So uh, it has two signatures on it of the people that worked on it. And one of them says, uh, Miss Elizabeth J. Goodfellow. And I think this explains why this was never finished, because uh, that's Dan's like, great, great aunt, and she died at the age of 15. Okay. So the other signature on the other side is Mrs. A. Goodfellow, and that's her grandmother. So that be how many greats would that be? <laughs> so so this was this was done sometime in the 1860s or 70s, probably. She died in 73. They lived in Springville. Yes, yeah, Springville, which is near Peterborough. And when you look at it, it, it it's not a very sophisticated pattern. Uh, so it's probably maybe the first one she was trying to make. Well, I don't know. So. But I, I think this is very interesting. So if you make a quilt, to we'll sign it. You know, your, your descendants might find that interesting. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's, and they stitch the sign, the sign, the signature. No, it looks like it's indelible ink, just written right in there. So, uh, and and this is something from Dan that Dan's grandmother made, and it's it's done with a with all that stuff. It's like strain. Um, yeah, string. Anyway, is it, it tatting or crochet? It, or it uh, appears to be knitted. knitted. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's a very fine, knitting. very fine knitting. Imagine how long that would take. Uh, but it's very interesting that you know if you like to have a blanket on your bed in the summertime, but you don't want to have your woolly blanket or your comforter because it's too hot. But this one isn't hot because it's just string and it's got holes in it. So if you like to sleep under a weight without heat, it's perfect. <laughs> 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 yeah, one more? Oh. Uh, Dan found this among his dad's stuff. It's an army cookbook. I don't know if you've ever seen one of those. Actually, it was our neighbor when I was growing up. He was a cook in World War II. Yeah, so, in so it, it's not a family heirloom, but I brought it because somebody might think that's interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I had, was bringing other cookbooks and I came across it. I did digitize it and put it on the web somewhere. Oh, wow. I've forgotten where. Oh, okay.
is it like recipes for 500 or yeah. something? Yeah, like that? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what where, to do with bully beef? Where did you grow up? Spam. <laughs> Unionville. Yes. <laughs> yes. See, my dad was a local printer. <laughs> <laughs> So my grandfather was a quartermaster sergeant. He had to find the ingredients for the 500 guys. <laughs> okay, I gotta go to Bob Bell. Okay. <laughs> so this is um, ancestry or 23andMe test. I've. I'll now be tested by all the companies. <laughs> um, good for one, good for all, I guess. So I started off Family Tree DNA. Um, I, that's my still my favorite one. And I've done all the tests with that. Um, I then did, did Ancestry next uh, with the logic that it's the biggest. Um, then I did Living DNA, which is uh, a European one. And I figured, um, fishing out of a different pool. And then uh, 23 and Me, I left it to last because it also has a medical aspect. And I thought some of the people, or more of the people might be just doing the medical with this. But I thought, eh. uh, So I waited until Black Friday and there was a sale on it through Amazon and really good price. And it got lost in the mail with the postal strike. <laughs> and it was supposed to be here last Monday and it arrived today, um, but it, it, it arrived. Um, I recommend everybody do a test, uh, use your own uh, companies. Uh, um, of course, the next question everybody says is, have you found anything great? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, very few relatives um, I'm finding on my father's side, just period. And on my mother's side, we're finding more but I'm not making any great discoveries with it, so I'm pushing it. But, uh, uh, don't expect miracles. Um, I do have one lead on my father's side. Um, I think there's something interesting in the person's history. They're being a wee bit cagey about how they might or the person might be related to me. Um, I'm hoping with time to make, but that's the only like really unique um, <coughs> contact I've had. Um, there's a second one that's just showing up on Family Tree DNA at the 67 level. I've only got two at the 67 level. Um, nobody above. And the Living DNA, they've just started to do matching. I've had zero. Uh, <laughs> but, but it is interesting. It is confirming some stuff. I am seeing with Ancestry some names I recognize popping up more and more frequently. And people that I do know, so yes, I am having luck with it, but it doesn't do your DNA. Yeah. Bob, do you think maybe because you've been doing genealogy a long time, mm -hmm. you're not coming across anything new because you research so thoroughly your your closest lines, you know, um, until that it gets back further where it's more nebulous? <laughs> no, because actually I'm not finding people that I even know in general. Well, perhaps I haven't tested. Yes, and I think that's a big thing. And so uh, I'd encourage everybody to get my relatives to get tested. <laughs> Forget about your own, get my... Uh, but um, I would like more of my relatives to get tested. And now I've spent all my money on all these, I may have to start subsidizing my families. <laughs> um, and, just to get more detail. Yep. I just have a quick question. Um, you said you did all of the tests, right? Yes. Is overseas in Ireland, Scotland, is one more predominant than the other? Overseas? I. Well, we had Morris Gleason out a couple of years ago, when uh, just after the conference in Toronto, and he seemed to be really pushing the family tree DNA. Um, I don't think Ancestry had really developed their market over there at that point in time. It's coming. I'm sure that they um, are gaining more market share there. But Living DNA is a British company, so I'd be expecting some of those. It's 
long as they get all the matches starting to show up. Yeah, and they've just started doing the matching. Just like it, uh, late November uh, was when I was in service. Uh, you do your test, at, uh, at least when I did it, it wasn't available. <coughs> but you click to say that when it is available, count me in. And so I did, and it was just last month, late last month, that they said, okay, uh, you can now see all the results. <laughs> and there's nothing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But I, I, I'm figuring a newer company, I'm, their tests are very detailed compared to, uh, it, it's comparable to family tree DNA. Uh, it's a one shot <laughs> test versus family tree DNA, you got to keep up being Yes, so just to say, uh, explain what Bob <coughs> means here is if you're a male, they do all three tests for you mitochondrial, autosomal, and um, Y DNA. Mm -hmm. And the women get autosomal and mitochondrial tests done. So it's a three tests in one or two tests in one. I thought we get one more. <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why? Why? Yeah, but it's Jesus, exactly. Good question. <laughs> yeah, what's the 67 match that you're talking about? That's Y DNA. Yeah, so the uh, number of markers. Yeah, it's the number of markers. Okay. okay. So the, yeah, so the, the closer you're, the more markers, in general, you know, the closer you're related. So you want to see lots, and what you're really hoping for is somebody just pops up <coughs> and really closely related and um, right names and all that. Bingo, oh, I didn't know about that person. Or, uh, I, I have had my mom tested um, and, um, you know, lucky, <laughs> she comes up as a uh, good match. It is always a danger that, um, you know, always prepared when you're doing these tests, you might but find things that you don't necessarily expect, but... Um, but that's true of genealogy in general. Yeah. You know, you, you don't do your genealogy unless you can handle anything you I find. Wanted, yeah. Yeah. I wanted to tell you that I knew nothing about my dad's side except his mother's name. Mm -hmm. And having done uh, the Ancestry DNA and uploading it, I've gone back about 30 or four great-great-grandfathers and they're all Bell. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> How come I can't find any? Yeah, Bob's having no luck with the bells. Yeah. yeah no, it'll be it. interesting. I'll, when I get it all loaded, I'll have you go and check my tree, and you might recognize some of the names. Yeah. It might be a long lost yeah. cousin or something. Well, I know our, our branch of the Bell family, there's not a lot of us male in Canada. And I'm presuming that's the problem that. They're all over there. Yeah, and they haven't been tested, is what I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm hoping. Uh, or there's, you know, maybe we're really Smith, and uh, you never I have, know. I have a feeling it's the Killen family that goes back and it's connected to the Bell, so we're getting all of that information from their DNA. Yeah, but with me, I'm not finding, back. I, I'm not finding alternate names. Yeah. So, like, if, if, if I was giving a lot of, and by having my mom tested with family tree DNA um, and linking us in there and saying, yes, here's how we're related, then it puts a little marker saying you're related on your mom's side or on your dad's yeah. side. Now, given that I've had my dad's, it's just you're related on your mom's side or Someone there's no else. notation. <laughs> and it's a surprising number of them are all on my mom's side. Mm -hmm. And even names, there's Bell names on my mom's side. Yeah. And there's Barker names, which are all my, on my dad's name. And there was even one that's a Bell and a Barker, which I would, I presumed until I tested my mom, that was on my dad's side, no brainer. Uh, but my mom's a Wilson, and the third name there is Wilson. So uh, obviously related through, probably, yeah. through my Wilsons there. Yeah. but. Uh, <laughs> so you don't jump to conclusions just because you see a name doesn't necessarily yeah. mean that's... Yeah. yeah. But you never know when you hit on one. You only have to find one yes. and then a daisy chain back. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, 
Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Joe. So you can story. My uh, maternal grandmother who was one of five children. Can you speak a little louder? Oh, sure. Use the mic. Use the mic. Yeah. No. Mic behind. Oh, sorry. That makes sense. Might be a little high for you. Fix that. It'll go down. Sure. Yeah, it will really go down. Oh, I don't think so. Testing. Yeah, that's okay. Um, those of you who attend the DNA meetings will know that I have already been talking about my find. Um, my paternal grandmother was one of five children, and. Uh, the youngest was a brother who was last seen in Gray County in 1898-99. Uh, he was on a land record and he was uh, he attended a wedding which uh, in the community which was documented in the local paper. So he went out west quotes, and he wrote to his mother, who was my great-grandmother, for some time, and then he failed to communicate. And uh, she wrote letters to the various places that he had uh, written her from and found no knowledge about him at all. Um, there was a family Bible that uh, had his last letter in it, and it was stolen from my parents' farmhouse so that uh, we uh, had no idea even where to start to look. But recently, I got a DNA match. Uh, 80 centimorgans on Ancestry, and this is consistent with what we discussed recently about the variation in the values. On uh, my heritage, it was described as 100 centimorgans. But anyway, this young woman, uh, has uh, a great great grandfather whose name was given as Herbert Harrison Shaw. Now I have the baptism record for grandmother's brother whose name was Robert Harrison Shaw. Now my great grandfather's name was Robert and Harrison, Robert Harrison, who was called Harry was named for his grandfather, which is consistent with the Irish name and pattern, because he was the third son. So anyway, I was told by one of my other relatives that this finding was on, uh, on uh, ancestry, and uh, in the meantime, I've had a few other of my Shaw relatives tested, and we have a definite connection. And the thing that confirms for me that this is correct is that when question mark Harrison Shaw died in 1955, which means that he outlived my grandmother, he outlived his older brother and sister, and the only person remaining was one brother. Anyway, when he died, his wife was the informant, and on the death certificate she wrote that his parents were Robert Shaw and Eleanor Deacon. And these were my great grandparents. So DNA has found a man that was missing <coughs> since sometime in the early 1900s and whose mother looked for him until she died in the 1920s. And he makes me very angry and it makes me also very sad because this man, for whatever reason, failed to continue to communicate with his family and they were concerned about him. So get your DNA done, do your due diligence with your paper trails because if I didn't know all this stuff and hadn't sat around and picked my grandmother's brain, some of my relatives who are showing DNA connections with this descendant of uh, Harry Shaw <coughs> didn't even know he existed. So ask the questions, write down the answers, and don't give up. Mm -hmm. Very good. And visit
visit your family. Yeah. <laughs> or be <he's> great. <right. laughs> Steve. Okay, I think I briefly mentioned this before, but I have here, and I'll leave it on the table so you can see it afterwards. It's a little faint, so I wrote it out. I have here a bastardy bond between Jones and Bliss. I wasn't even looking for it. I happened to be in the, uh, it's called the Northamptonshire Archives and Heritage Catalog. And I was, I believe I was even looking through a different time period and certainly a different <coughs> surname. And it was at the bottom of some other records that came up. And all it said was Bastardy Bond, Edward Jones of Cosgrove and Mary Bliss, 1782. Well, I have Mary Bliss, who was baptized 20th of May, 1764, in Pottersbury Parish in Northamptonshire, England. And she was the daughter of John Bliss and Elizabeth Worcester. Is that any better? No, that's good. You're good. Great. Okay. Uh, she had siblings, John and William, baptized on the same day, so I don't know exactly her birthday. Now, Benjamin Jones Bliss was baptized on the 29th of June, 1783, in Pottersbury Parish, the son of Mary Bliss. Quite often, these girls would we'll say shame for want of a better description, the uh, person that got them pregnant by naming their child part of it. So uh, for years, I've been looking for a Benjamin Jones, who I figured was the father of uh, Benjamin Jones Bliss. Well, not quite. Close, but no cigar. I'll just read a little bit from the start of it. Know all men by these presents that we, Edward Jones the Elder of Cosgrove in the county of Northampton, Yeoman, and Edward Jones the Younger of the same place, son of the said Edward Jones the Elder, are held and firmly bound to Joshua Wood, Francis Edge, and Samuel Cockrell, church wardens and overseers of the poor of Pottersbury, blah, blah, blah. For 40 pounds and... Might as well have read the whole thing out, but anyways, it's it's in 1782. Whereas Mary Bliss of Pottersbury, aforesaid single woman, is great with child, and the said child is likely to be born a bastard, and to be chargeable to said parish, and the said Mary Bliss doth charge the above found Edward Jones the younger with being the father of the said child or children with which she is now pregnant. And whereas the said Edward Jones the Elder and Edward Jones the Younger have agreed to indemnify the parish parishioners of said parish of and from all charges and expenses which they may sustain or be put onto by reason of said child or children with which the said Mary Bliss is now pregnant, being born in the said parish of Pottersbury. So it goes up on a little more, but basically I got that Edward Jones was the father and his father was also Edward Jones. And so it was a, a two-four win. <laughs> because in the Cosgrove Northamptonshire records, there was an Edward Jones baptized the 25th of October, 1761, the son of Edward and Mary Jones. There was also an Edward Jones baptized 14th of February, 1760, just a year earlier, the son of William and Susanna Jones. So I would have had troubles figuring out which one it was uh, if it weren't for the double naming on the document. So not only did I get the father, I got the grandfather. Uh, to sum it up, Edward Jones was buried on the 14th of May, 1790 in Cosgrove. He never married. So this was the only child uh, that I know about <laughs> from this, uh, this side of the family. His, cousin, it turns out to be a first cousin, of uh, the other Edward, did have a quite a large family. He and Susanna did have a, or no, Susanna was the mother. But, so the, the other, the branch did continue down quite well. But I'll leave this on the uh, table here if you want to look at it. But it was a great find and all by accident because I wasn't even looking for it. Very good. I have two questions about that. What, what are these people to you? 
They're my direct ancestors. Mary Bliss is my, mm, I'm going to say about fifth or sixth great uh, grandmother. So it's a direct ancestor on my dad's side. And my other question is, I, I guess the purpose of that whole thing is so that the parent will actually provide some upkeep, so, so the kid won't be on the, on the parish? That's right. The parish didn't want to have to pay anything for keeping the upkeep of, of the child. So they made yeah. the Jones family swear that they would help contribute money for so the upkeep. we know how long that 40 pounds has to last? <laughs> <laughs> I know it went further than it does now. Yeah. I, probably, I mean, till, probably till he was apprenticed to somebody. Yeah. Yeah, that could be. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're a little short on, on, uh, on people, so does anybody want to learn about Google Keep? Is there anybody else that wants to speak? Oh yeah, let's start with that. Anybody else got a good story? Or a find? Or a new resource? Don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Google Keep It Is. Google Keep It Is. So I did a, a, a presentation at the Ajax Public Library about three weeks ago. Yeah, thank you. And it was a repeat of a presentation I did uh, a couple of years ago. But of course, Google doesn't stand still. They take things away and they bring things in. So there was this new thing called Google Keep, and I was wondering, I had only heard it mentioned maybe once, so I thought I'd have a look at it, and if I could get the internet up. Uh, I wanted to, to shrink this a little bit so I could get more of the screen in. But to any. Okay. So it is basically a bit of a um, note-keeping program that's not as full-blooded, obviously, as Word. It's a bit of a to-do list. You can actually do um, check boxes. So where you start is this take a note. Give it a title. If you want a, a um, checkbox list, you can go in this menu option. You can add images. When you're actually in the Chrome browser, you can add websites. Uh, when you're in Google Mail, Gmail, you can add emails. And I've actually done that further down. Let me look at that. Okay. You can pin certain um, uh, memos to the top and keep them where you can see them every time you log in. Uh, there's a, a to-do list. I did that one. And so it goes to the very bottom. Um, there's a simple research plan I put together here where I'm going to try and find a certain marriage at the Anglican Church in Uxbridge, so I have to contact them, see if they have records, and then if not, the Anglican Diocese Archives in Toronto, and I've downloaded their help items. Yes, Anne? Uh, Nancy, if you, if you make this at home on your laptop, and then you're out somewhere, can you watch it on your phone? There are apps. Yeah. 
that you can download and it will talk from your iPhone <laughs> and I think even Android tablets and Android phones as well. I happen to have iPhone, iPad and a Mac so uh, those are the ones I know for sure. And if Dan had brought his overhead camera I could put my phone underneath. <laughs> But I'll, I'll, I can show anybody who wants to come up and look at it on the phone. So uh, further down here, so here's one that I took off of um, a, an email that has had the uh, internet link. Uh, came down from the Oxford Genealogy Group. It was a soldier's project. And then I actually went to the uh, website and so you can see I've, I've got the same the same web link attached to that. I was watch, uh, reading an email um, on a blog and I uh, clipped that 235 birth marriages and death records at Ancestor Hunt for Canada. So I'm going to check that out sometime. So this is actually helping me with those bright shiny objects. So I'm working away at something and you know your thought pops up in your head or you see a result or you read something that you want to go explore. I just throw it in one of these. So I don't forget about it but it doesn't take me away from what I'm working on right now. So it's beginning to tame that uh, rabbit hole that bright shiny object problem that I've had for the last 30 years. <laughs> um, there's also one here, uh, an author I want to try and I actually can't remember where I got the picture of the book, probably on Amazon or something like that and I clipped that one. And here's my attempt to get rid of the piles in my study. I'm going to actually go and, and uh, pull out all my um, handouts from lectures, scan them into Evernote. It's, it's, I haven't started it yet, though. <laughs> so, so what would you, I, I use OneNote, why is Google Keep? Why do you need both? Uh, you wouldn't necessarily. OneNote's a little more analogous to Evernote itself, mm -hmm. which I think you can do um, bigger notes and more tags. but. You can see here that I've actually got a tag on this. And I think I can put more than one label. These are labels I've actually created myself, so you just create one. Well, let's close that. So you can edit the labels, you can get rid of them, you can add a new label. You can color code if you want. Um, Nancy, do those labels also correspond to your email, Gmail labels? Actually, they don't, mm -hmm. because I'm only just playing with this right now. Uh, my Gmail labels, I've got way too many. Way too many. So I'm trying, you know, I, I'm on the social committee for our condo, so I, tomorrow night's the condo Christmas dinner. I had about eight things I needed to do, so been keeping track of that for the branch for my personal genealogy and then other stuff so I so far that's working for me and do you have to be in a particular browser to use this I don't believe so because you just do it the same way you do Gmail which Gmail is mail.google.com so you go to a website yeah or a web on, on, on web the address. computer yes on your desktop or laptop computer but when you're in for instance uh, Android or iOS it's an app okay so it's not connected in fact you can't clip at least I haven't found a way to clip uh, you know on a website when I'm on my iPad it only seems to work when I'm in a browser okay So it's just, as I said, I'm finding it useful to keep me from going down those rabbit holes.
that you run across when you're researching. And all you've spent five hours and you have still haven't answered what you really started to work on. Do you know where is this information actually? Is it in your cloud somewhere? Or? It's, it's on Google. It's up in the Google cloud, yeah. And you do have to have a Google account. And if you've got Gmail uh, or Blogger, uh, or you subscribe to channels in YouTube, which you don't need an account for, but if you do, you can actually get notifications on channels when they put up a new video. Um, so, when you're in a Google product, they often have this nine squares making a bigger square, which really is kind of their menu. So you can go and, like I could now go to my Gmail, and I always leave it signed in. I never log out of Google, so that's why I didn't have to sign in on, on this particular demo. But you just keep going down, there's the Keep, there's Blogger, Hangouts is Video Hangouts with someone else who has a Google account. Um, they also have like Docs, which is the same as Word, um, Google Books, we've had um, lectures on that. So there's, Google's got hundreds of little programs and apps, but what you're doing for them is you're actually giving them analytics that they can sell to companies. So they do watch what you do and they do target advertising to you. So that's one thing you do have to be aware of with Google. It's probably too late for we genealogists to pretend we're not interested in genealogy and we don't want Google to know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it's probably why you get all the Ancestry ads. <laughs> Ancestry, I'm sure, pays them big bucks to put those ads on our email and stuff. So th that's just a brief look at it, but I have to admit that was, that was kind of uh, a new discovery for me. I found it very interesting. And on my iPad, which is becoming more and more my usual thing to use, it's right up there front and center. Anybody else have anything they want to say or show or mention? Okay. Um, this isn't really genealogy, but I don't know if anybody else has that malware called My Way. What's it called? My Way. Malware that's called My, My Way. Way. Yeah, I just got it a couple of days ago, so I just have to take the computer in. What does it do? It, when you search with, uh, uh, is it a um, Firefox, is that your browser? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Fire, any of them, um, uh, Chrome, and you put the search query or whatever you're looking for, then it returns, everything it returns back to you says, ad, 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 like advertising, like short form in front of it. And it goes through pages of these ads and then maybe you finally get your query on the fourth. <laughs> and um, it's and pretty it's annoying. stuff that you haven't asked for, like a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I can't find it on my computer. I don't know a lot about looking, like to uh, uninstall it. So, so it's really irritating. Yeah. Uh, do you have a PC? Yeah. Computer? Yeah. Okay. So those of you with PCs, whatever you do, don't click on anything that says my way. Well, I think it, it's just some ad I clicked on or some something and then it just brought it in. Yeah. Uh, what, um, well, good luck with that one. I just got ADHD or a basket or anything. So but there are, as well as virus removers, there are adware removers. Malware bytes. Is there something that I should yeah. download? Malware bytes. Malware bytes? B-Y-T-E-S? Yes. 
malware bytes. Okay. Okay. When you open the browser, it's does it automatically go to this page yeah, first? Yeah, it just automatically. So everything could, will have my way. So it could be what you <laughs> check to see what your home page. It could be your home page has been reset mm -hmm. to be that. Yes. And so it could be it could be an easy fix or it could be a, a bad one. But to check to see what your home page is set to. Like, how, how do you mean set to? Like, it would say right along the address line? No. You would have to probably go into your settings, and it's probably under general. Account settings. Um, I haven't done PC looking for a while, so someone else jump in here. Well, I have one, but I don't want to mess with it right <laughs> now. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. I was going to take it to that one up in Brooklyn. Like that. that might be the easiest. Say that name again. Yeah. Where? Malware. M-A-L. Yeah. B-Y-T-S. Dot com. And it's free for the first time. Okay. I guess what I'll try it. Just to see. Yeah, they let you try it for free, but that's all you need is to try it. Once. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, yes. Yeah. And then uh, just check to see what your home page is set to. Yeah. Oh, it, would, it would say my way in front of everything I guess. For yeah. your page. I, I'm guessing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Okay, just a note of interest. Uh, we're not having a December meeting for the DNA special interest group. Can I just add a couple of things? There's been a couple of interesting things come through. Uh, <coughs> my heritage has extended. Yeah. Uh, I got a notice not too long ago. My heritage has extended their uh, deadline to upload for free. I believe it's till the 15th of December now. I could be wrong. Yeah, I didn't get mine in either. <laughs> so you got a few more days if you want to upload any results to, for free to their website. Uh, for the, I've done it, but explain to people what it what you're talking about. I'll let you. Okay. You'll be more articulate. Um, okay. So, say you've tested an Ancestry or Family Tree DNA or 23andMe, even if you have tested Living DNA. There are, uh, there is a setting where you can go in and <coughs> download your raw data in a file then you can upload that to sites that accept it. So Ancestry won't, and 23andMe won't. But Family Tree DNA will accept your data. My Heritage will accept your data. Living DNA, maybe? Does anybody know on that one? I don't think Not so. Not sure. Yeah, didn't they do something for free for a little bit? I don't know if it's still... Uh, there's a possibility that my living DNA does it. And uh, the third party site called GEDmatch. That's how you get your data up on there. They don't sell a test, but they host a site where you can get matches from all other companies. So that's what Steve's talking about. Uh, my Heritage, when they came into the market, uh, decided that they would allow free uploads of uh, tests that you had done in anywhere else. I think it was to build their database so that they could begin to compete with Family Tree DNA and, and Ancestry. So they announced a while ago that December 1st was going to be the end of the free uploads. So this is why it's exciting. I've only got, I've I've got a lot of kits that I have paid for, Bob, <laughs> of, of cousins and sisters and my mother and my husband and, and a couple of, yeah, about four or five of my cousins, okay? Well, I've only got myself and one sister up in my heritage and I really need to get the rest of them up there. <laughs> And I went home thoroughly intending to do that on Friday, and I didn't get around to it. And so this is great news for me. Thank you. You look fast. 
Yes, <laughs> December 15th. I'm talk. not 100% sure on the date. It, I yeah. think that was probably it, but. Okay, well that's good. Something like that. Now you have another one to talk Just about. Just one other little thing that uh, Dick Eastman's website, he puts little tidbits out there and he had something on about DNA as well, and I thought it might be of interest. Uh, apparently it's from, I believe, a popular mechanics book, believe it or not, or met the magazine or website or something that he's taken it from. But they have now found that in some instances, some of the X chromosome might have come from the father. According Mitochondrial. Or, sorry. Mitochondrial DNA. Yeah. Okay. Which we've yeah. always thought only came from the mother to her children. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, Dick Eastman um, thought that it was a very technical paper and he would leave it to us to read the paper and decide for ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> which is not going to help us very much because I'm not sure we could puzzle through it. <laughs> but they seem to have found about three families and 17 individuals who've actually got mitochondrial DNA from both sides of their family instead of just their mother, which just blows the whole thing out of the water. <laughs> <laughs> we could be in trouble. <laughs> yeah, it could be very interesting. <clears throat> Or it could also be good for somebody like yourself with no uh, DNA from your dad. True. Yeah. Maybe. Although I got a letter, I, um, <laughs> I put it in a Ziploc bag, and as soon as my heritage announced at their Oslo convention, um, and I'm not sure when that was, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, something like that, that they have a partner they're going to be working with no price was mentioned um, but I think somebody said something about like a thousand dollars where they would take artifacts like stamps and envelope flaps and get DNA from it of course in the process you actually destroy that artifact they have to use it and use it all up so I've got a letter, I know my father wrote to my youngest sister. My mother and my youngest sister had ended up uh, in the summer at a church camp. Mum was the camp nurse and Allison got dragged along even though she wasn't old enough to be a camper. So I know my father actually licked that stamp. Usually it was my mother who did the writing. So I've got that one and I've got it in a Ziploc bag and I hope not too many people have handled it in the years since. And I'm just waiting <laughs> for them to announce the actual uh, test is ready. Currently, um, uh, Gilad, the owner, CEO of MyHeritage, has some of his uh, artifacts being tested, working through the process. So it's kind of exciting news. But just keep in mind, a, a curl that was cut off a baby head is no good to you. There's, you still have to have the root. And if it was cut off, there's no root. So they're just looking at stamps and envelopes at this point in time. Unless there's something else they could be really sure it was soaked with saliva. <laughs> so postcards from World War I, for instance? So Probably. <laughs> Actually, I also have all my dad's letters from the Air Force in World War II to his mother. It's, it's getting a lot. I got this many airmail envelopes. Airmail, not even envelopes. What are those papers you folded and licked? <laughs> and uh, so, although that's probably 30 years older than my, the letter you wrote my youngest sister, that's also a possibility, but I would darn well photocopy them first. <laughs> okay, so this is what's coming up. So, in January, and we've had good news from the church. As I walked in the door, the minister told me, they've actually put up the lights, painted the ceiling and the walls, and they're gonna clean it next, and they just have to do the floor upstairs. 
and they've got uh, people who will bring all our book, uh, book boxes up to the room for us. I'm hoping that we'll have our meeting in January upstairs in our new space. Not sure we can unpack the boxes quite that fast, so keep our fingers crossed. But I'm really hoping for that. So January the 8th, not January the 1st. Um, not sure I want to try and run a meeting with a hangover. Nancy, did they keep the board table up there? Yes. Yes. But they don't know how we've got it all set up, so they're going to give us a call, Steve and I, um, when they're ready to do the work so that we can go and direct them where to put everything uh, again. Um, brick wall problems. We're going to be talking about those pesky little people who came from Mars in our family. Um, if you have a problem, Steve would like to have a crack at it before January, unless he's pack unpacking boxes, that is. <laughs> so there's the email address to get your um, problem to Steve before January, durhamresearch at ogs.on.ca. Uh, on the 5th of February, we've got Lisa Tarek coming uh, with a virtual tour of the Oshawa Museum. And the 5th of March, Bob Dawes, we've had him before, he's from Quinty area, called the Easy Do-Over. So there's something called the Genealogy Do-Over. And it's quite intensive and I've tried to get my head around it and wondering if I could actually do it, but I've got way too many stacks of piles of stuff. So he's promising an easy do-over, so I've got to hear this. And that's our contact information for anybody who wants to find us on our blog or our Facebook group, or even YouTube to see the recordings of our meetings. And I wish you all a, all those online, a Merry Christmas, and uh, too bad you're not here to eat the goodies with us. <laughs> Yeah. Could be more of my biggest problem.